Welcome to the Keeping It Simple series for Pediatric Shelf. Now these are really, really fun, but you need to make sure you kind of get the viruses right because this is one of the things that they like, um, is going to be some of our classic pediatric diseases that you need to recognize to know you're not gonna do a lot. You're just gonna support them. So first one is going to be roseola. And your mother will tell you stories of your roseola experience if you ask her, because almost everybody tests positive for it at a certain point in time. So usually these kids will have 103, 104 fevers, high spiking, and then the fever goes boom, drops and these kids break out and this pink papular rash everywhere. There's a picture of it. Um, and the kids can have during the high spiking fever febrile seizures. So what you'll usually get is a one-year-old presents with a past history of 104, 105 um, fevers. He had a febrile seizure. Now the fever's broken and he's got this rash all over. You want to do a spinal tap. You want to do a CT scan of his head or just supportive care um, and watch. And it's supportive care. It's roseola caused by the HSV. V6 virus. Fifth disease or erythema infectiosum is also very, very common. This is caused by parvovirus B19, and usually the kids will have a low grade fever, and then they get the slap cheeked appearance, and it really is a slap cheek appearance. They look like they've burned their, their cheeks, um, which is very characteristic. Then they get this reticular rash that's on their upper extremities, and it looks lacy. Now, who should you not let them be around? So they, they may give you a story with mom's pregnant and brings in her two-year-old um, who's now got this low-grade fever, red cheeks, and this reticular rash. So is that a problem for mom? Yeah, it's a problem. She needs to see her OBGYN, so you will send her in your answer to see her OBGYN. We also have to be very careful with our sickle cell patients because it can shut down the bone marrow, and so their, their red cells aren't going to be made at the production rate they need, so they can get an aplastic crisis with that. Anything that has a shortened red cell life is going to be at risk, so thalassemia is also at risk. So classically, the kids will have sore throat and a strawberry tongue, and they get the sandpaper rash. And it's like this fine rash that when you run your fingers over, it feels like sandpaper. They can also get desquamation of their fingers and their toes. Um, treatment's going to be penicillin. Um, you'll go ahead and get a strep culture on those kids too. Impetigo is very, very common, and it usually has these honey-colored crusted plaques, and usually it's going to be due to staph aureus. If they have non-bullous impetigo, then what can they get? Not only can you get um, the renal uh, post-strep glomerulonephritis from the throat, you can also get it from strep impetigo. So make sure if they give you a skin rash that was non-bullous impetigo looking, and then they show up with the Coca-Cola urine and the hypertension, that you also realize that the strep can come from uh, impetigo of that type too. Um, topical mepiracin is what we use. It's just a topical little antibacterial type thing. Um, and try and keep the kids from scratching at it, which is like really impossible. Um, measles, three C's. So measles is going to be cough, conjunctivitis, and coryza. Classic pathognomonic finding is going to be coplic spots. So if they give you little white bumps on the buccal mucosa, that is going to be what they're trying to tell you is the kid's got coplic spots and you have a diagnosis of measles. Um, treatment is supportive care and vitamin A has been shown to make a difference um, in their eventual, um, to improve things. Mostly in areas where they're vitamin A deficient, I must admit. Um, hand, foot, and mouth disease. Does anybody need to know the three locations where the rash can occur? on the hands, in the feet, and on the mouth. And so the biggest thing is when they give you that, they are looking for Coxsackie virus A16 um, is the most common cause. But usually these kids have vesicles in their mouth, vesicles on their hands, and vesicles on the soles of their feet. Does anybody know what the complication can be from Coxsackie? What else can it cause? You can get myocarditis with that one. And so that's the biggest thing that they're usually looking for is by myocarditis is caused by the Coxsackie virus. Um, Anybody miss the mumps on this child? Um, this is a swollen parotid gland. Um, usually they show up with fever. Um, we have not seen that much mumps because of the MMR. Um, so usually this is not going to be that common of a disease. Complications or orchitis and sterility. Um, and so that's the biggest reason. Although there have been a couple of communities that have reported problems with this with um, the lack of vaccinations. So if they give you an unvaccinated child, this is something that you should consider. Ear infections, I'm going to say a couple of things because these are usually the points they like. The best diagnostic test for 
um, acute otitis media is Insufflation, right? So what you've got to do is insufflation, limited mobility, the tympanic membrane with insufflation. That's supposed to be the best test to make the diagnosis. Redness doesn't count. Pinkness doesn't count. A ready pinkness doesn't count. So it's going to be, if they give you that one side moves and the other side doesn't, that's going to be acute otitis media. The biggest question they usually ask is, what are you going to use to treat it? We have such a high strep pneumo rate of infection that if they tell you the kid goes to daycare, the kids had one before, um, almost any kid, you'd go high dose now on the amoxicillin. So it's 80 to 90 milligrams per kilo per day, and that's to do the penicillin resistant um, strep pneumo. And if they do not improve, like they come back to you, then switch to augment, and that's recommended second line. Otitis externa is going to be thick exudates that are in the ear canal. Usually they've got tenderness when they touch the tragus or when you um, move the ear gently, that's going to cause them pain. That's how you can distinguish otitis externa. Um, usually if you can get in to look at the eardrum, that's helpful. Sometimes it's very difficult. Topical ciprofloxacin is going to be what you're going to use to treat it and a wick for severe inflammation. So if they say you can't see anything, a lot of people will use the wicks to go in there to start to open it up um, and to start to treat the infection with the Cipro. Group A beta hemolytic strep, pharyngitis, sore throat, fever, absence of cough, and tender cervical lymph nodes. Rapid streps. That's going to be a rapid strep antigen test. It's going to be what you're going to order. If it's positive, you're going to treat with penicillin. If it's negative, most people still send a culture, um, but most people do not treat. So if they say the rapid strep is negative, what are you going to do with supportive care pending culture results? If that, you know what I mean, usually they'll put um, Supportive care pending culture results is usually what they'll have listed. This is one of the things that you can see in kids under six years of age or under eight years of age. So you know how, the, uh, how little kids always have lymph nodes everywhere? Like if you ever touch a kid's throat, you can always feel lymph nodes from, uh, they just tend to have bigger lymphoid development. They also have bigger lymph nodes in the lymph nodes that are in front of their um, C-spine, in front of their cervical spine. So when they get an infection, it can actually extend and cause an infection that goes in the retropharyngeal space in addition to the throat. So what we will see classically is a muffled voice, a stiff neck, and the kids will lean forward. They can have a little bit of strider, but they're drooling because look at how big that swelling is in front of that kid's neck. Usually that distance is going to only be half the width of the vertebral body. So look at how swollen that is pushing forward. That kid's going to have a lot of problems swelling. Now how do you tell um, retropharyngeal um, abscess cellulitis from meningitis? Well. Kids that have stiff necks that can kick you in the face that have a negative Koenig's, Brzezinski's are going to be retropharyngeal cellulitis or abscess. Kids that cannot do the kick or the bend, you have to be concerned about meningeal inflammation versus the retropharyngeal inflammation. Um, soft tissue lateral neck is usually really a quick test and it'll show you exactly what you want to do for that. Um, never, ever, ever, ever send a kid that's got strider difficulty breathing to CT. So if they give you that choice, like they make the kids sound like they're having airway difficulties, um, always start with giving them oxygen, doing a portable film, don't let them leave the department um, or keep them where you are. ENT consult and antibiotics are going to be what you're going to use for definitive treatment. If they give you a kid with a hot potato voice, they like all these little things that they, hot potato voice, and you look and the uvula is deviated and one side is swollen, they're going for peritonsillar abscess. Um, if the kid is little, which they usually aren't, they're usually going to give you 14, 15, 16, 17 year old. Um, the older kids, they actually do um, aspiration and incision and drainage, and we'll try to do them in the department under sedation, um, and then give them antibiotics. Um, so those are going to be usually treated um, with a drainage of the uh, infection and antibiotics. Croup is probably the most common thing you'll see. Usually, in contrast to strep, do, strep, do kids with strep have a cough? No, they do not have a cough. Do kids with croup have a cough? Yes, they sound like barking seals. They've got a high-pitched um, barky cough, and they do <clears throat> inspiratory strider. Usually they show up at midnight to 4 a.m. because it's a nighttime disease. Don't ask me why, but they do. Um, fever URI. So usually you're going to get a kid who shows up at 1 a.m. in the morning with he had a runny nose earlier. Now he's got strider. He's got a barky cough, and he's got the strider on inspiration. Most common cause, sometimes they're going to ask you what the bug is. It's parainfluenza. 
clinical diagnosis. You don't need to do x-rays. So if they give you Barky, cough, strider, um, you do not need to do x-rays. We can go on to treatment. So what would you use to treat them? If they're non-striders, when you see them, just dexamethasone. Steroids work great. Give them one dose, 0.6 per kilo. Um, and oral has been shown to work as well as a shot. So be nice to the kid and give them an oral dose and send them home. If they are striderous at the time you see them and working to breathe, racemic epi is what they're looking for. And that will acutely cause the swelling in the back of their throats to go down and will acutely make them better. They also need their dose of steroids also. Epiglottitis has almost gone away. These kids usually show up in the tripod position. They're unimmunized. So usually they'll give you the story of either an Amish community or a community that is committed to non-vaccinating their kids. Then they'll give you the story of the kid leaning forward, um, sick appearing, drooling, um, no cough. Kids with epiglottitis do not cough because it's too it's too dangerous for them to move. They usually hold themselves very still, have drooling and have that tripod position. They never leave your sight. Any answer they give you should never involve them leaving you. So if you suspect epiglottitis, every choice is portable. They come to me or I take them to the OR. So you just do not leave the patient. If you get a portable x-ray, it will show the thumbprint sign. And you can see on that x-ray right below the jaw where the epiglottis has that um, thumbs up sign. Um, do not leave the patient, go to the OR and intubate them. Kids die from asphyxia, from epiglottitis, because what used to happen is it used to swell up and occlude the airway. They died from asphyxia. So if they get intubated, they usually get 24 hours of antibiotics, they pull the tube and the kids are fine and go home. So it's very important that these kids are managed very carefully in that first phase. Bronchiolitis is gonna be what we see with coughing kids, and usually these kids have cold symptoms. RSV is the most common cause of bronchiolitis. And they like, RSV is bronchiolitis, croup is parainfluenza. So croup is parainfluenza, RSV is bronchiolitis. Um, treatment is supportive care. No one wants you to do anything anymore. So if it's a seven month old with a runny nose who now is wheezing and he's comfortable and has an okay O2 sat 98% and he's drinking well, your job is to do nothing except supportive care. So don't try anything, don't give him uh, albuterol or steroids, just uh, supportive care. Whooping cough, you will get a case of whooping cough because the government is very concerned about how many cases of whooping cough there are. And so the boards kind of reflect what we're worried about. So these kids can either be unimmunized or kids that have not had a full set of vaccination or older kids with a chronic cough. So usually they'll have, if they give you the classic story, which they usually do, it's a baby who's having terrible, terrible coughing spells and they go cough, 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 cough whoop and they whoop. Um, usually they turn blue during those whooping spells. Um, they stop breathing um, and some of them will vomit right afterwards. It is caused by Bordetella pertussis and the treatment is erythromycin um, or azithromycin. If they're younger, we don't use the azithromycin because of pyloric stenosis concern. So usually if they're under two months, we just stick with the erythromycin. UTI. Don't ever, ever, ever turn, choose bag urinalysis for any choice on any pediatric shelf exam. Um, do you think those are a little contaminated if you put a bag on a kid who's not potty trained? Yeah, you can grow 50 to 60 different kinds of bacteria very easily. So no bag urines ever. If you are concerned in a non-potty trained kid and they wanna know what the diagnostic procedure of choice is, it's super pubic or it's a calf. So that's how you're gonna get your urine. Um, clean catch only if they're potty trained. If they're potty trained and are able to do that, then you can have the mom clean them up and do a clean catch urine. They all get urines and cultures. So don't pick just urinalysis. We wanna know what bug they grow and um, what it's sensitive to um, in pediatrics. Um, the reason we're identifying those is kids can have reflux. Um, so they can have the reflux, so the bladder can fill up and then it can reflux back up into the kidneys. And we don't want them to get chronic kidney damage. So if we see a kid that has um, a first time urinary tract infection, what two tests are we gonna do? Renal ultrasound and a VCUG. And then we'll identify kidneys are normal, do they have any reflux? Do we need to put them on prophylactic antibiotics? If they have a urinary tract infection, um, they will not ask you what antibiotic to use because pediatricians can't decide. Um, Bactrim's fine, Suprax is fine, um, but there's controversy as to which antibiotic um, 
would be appropriate. And if you look at the second line with all my alternatives I listed, there's a lot of them. So usually they don't ask that question. So let's go through our infectious disease review. So roseola is HSV6, right? High spiking fever, fever breaks and they break out in this rash all over their body. Um, and sometimes they've had a febrile seizure with that high spiking fever. Fifth disease is gonna be erythema infectiosum and it's caused by parvovirus B19, low grade fever and it's bad if you're pregnant or have sickle cell disease or anything else that affects your hemoglobin like thalassemia. Scarlet fever is the sandpaper rash, right? Impetigo is going to be those honey colored crusted lesions that you can see, usually it's around the mouth and the nose. If they have ones that are non bolus think about strep, if they come back with Coca-Cola urine, um, and you have to worry about the post um, strep post nephritis. Measles, three Cs, right? Cough, coryza, conjunctivitis, and coplic spots, which sounds like it all should go together. And coplic spots are pathognomonic, so if they give you that, you know you've got the measles case. Um, hand, foot, and mouth disease is Coxsackie virus 18, I mean A16, and those are gonna be mouth, hands, and soles of the feet. And mumps, we know the complications are orchitis and sterility from that. Um, acute otitis media, make sure you know this most sensitive test is gonna be insufflation, and we use high dose amoxicillin, 80 to 90 milligrams per kilo per day. Group A beta hemolytic strep, usually they don't have a cough, they've got the lymph nodes, pus on the tonsils, fever, and rapid strep tests are what we're gonna use to make the diagnosis. Retropharyngeal abscesses, they've got the muffled voice, the stiff neck, treatment's gonna be antibiotics and ENT. Peritonsillar abscesses, we're gonna be able to see on physical exam, we'll have the deviated uvulum, the swollen tonsil, and they're gonna get an IND um, with ENT and then get antibiotics. Let's see, croup, what's the most common virus? Because I gotta wake you guys up a little bit. Parainfluenza. Um, X-ray shows a steeple sign that's narrowing from below the um, level so that you can see that. That's what causes the strider. What's our first treatment if they're acutely in distress? Racemic epi. What's the thing that makes it not come back? Let's everybody go to work the next morning. Dexamethasone and get a good night's sleep the next night. Dexamethasone. Uh, epiglottitis, unimmunized, right? And usually what position do they assume? Tripod, drooling, um, and never, ever, ever leave a patient with epiglottitis. Last one is bacterial meningitis. Um, this is going to be unusual now, but do not ignore it. So if they give you a case with a kid that's not full on their immunizations or unimmunized and has a headache and stiff neck and has a positive Koenig's where they um, pull up with their neck when you kick their leg or um, Brzezinski's where you bend the knee and they're pulling up so they've got spinal irritation, um, they need a spinal tap. If they give you any unstable vital signs at all, you may start antibiotics without the LP. Always remember, you don't need to do the LP if the kid's unstable. Um, if the kid's stable, then you can do the LP, but usually they don't ask you that. Um, most common is gonna be strep pneumo. If they're under four weeks of age, what's gonna be the most common bugs? E. coli, group E strep, and listeria. So we're gonna cover for those. Over that age group, over three months, we're gonna worry about strep pneumo, and this is important. The resistance rate is now so high with the strep pneumo that if you actually think the kid has strep pneumo meningitis, it is not just ceftriaxone, it's vancomycin and ceftriaxone. So you need to use the combination because the vancomycin covers the resistant bugs. That will bring us to the end of the section. <laughs>